PFAS are known as forever chemicals. And in short, it's a group of chemicals that contain a substance called carbon fluorine. And this essentially makes the chemicals very strong and thus prevents it from breaking down. Now, this has beneficial properties. That's why it's used in industry. And it can make materials oil and water resistant. So that's why you find it on, say, non-stick coating. Uh, coatings that would apply to, say, frying pans and so on. Now, at the same time, PFAS also have a negative impact on human health and also the environment, which is why PFAS is increasingly subject to restrictions in the EU and is likely to become even more so in the future. Now, PFAS uh, of different types can be found in everything from f- food packaging and nonstick cookware, as just mentioned, to furniture clothing, cosmetics, and even building materials. I'm sure you could add a long list of other products here as well. PFAS are restricted under REACH, both under Annex 17 and as SVHCs. Now, Annex 17 provides a list of, essentially, substances are either restricted to a certain maximum allowed limit and other conditions, or banned. It's more of a hard restriction in that sense. Whereas SVHCs, these are substances that can be allowed up to a certain amount as a percentage by weight. And if it's above that, then you need to report that you need to report the presence of the substance through the skip database. So you have a hard limit, a hard cap, and then you have a reporting requirement. Now, what we could find uh, in Annex 17 is the following. So we could find um, a few restrictions related to PFCA and maximum limitations. You can see here. That being said, there was um, more than a year ago now, in January 2023, a proposal to include more than 10,000 PFAS under reach. So it's quite likely that more of these substances are on the way out or, well, on the way in, in the context of being included and thus restricted or even banned under Annex 17. Let's look at SVHCs. So SVHCs stand for substance of very high concern. If the amount of listed substances, and these are some of the SV, uh, sorry, PFAS substances that we could find, are above 0.1% by weight, then you need to report this through the SKIP database. How would you know? Either you obtain a bill of substances, or you must submit, you must send a product for testing. These are the two parts of REACH, and they currently cover different PFAS. Then we also have the persistent organic pollutants, or the POPs, the POPs regulation. This is often confused with REACH, but it's actually a separate regulation. And in short, you can also find um, additional PFAS restrictions under Annex 1 and also under Annex 4. As you can see here, they set restrictions on the basis of um, percentage by weight. <coughs> Sorry. So that's what you find under POPS, of the POPs regulation. Let's look at the more product-specific regulation. That's the Plastic Food Contact Materials Regulation, also known as 10-2011. And here we could find a few more restrictions that concern PFAS. That this regulation, it only impacts plastic food contact materials. And that would be, well, non-stick cookware or this plastic spatula that you see on the right, or a plastic lunchbox, or any other type of plastic material that is intended to contain food or beverage. What this means is that in addition to the reach requirements that concern PFAS, if you sell plastic food contact materials, you also have to comply with the additional restrictions under 10.2011. And finally, we could find PFAS restrictions uh, under the CLP regulation. All 
Right. So what can be confusing is the fact that PFAS restrictions are not concentrated into, let's say, a single regulation or a single annex, but as you can see, are spread out. So you have some PFAS restrictions that go under reach, uh, Annex 17, some are considered as SVHS or substances of very high concern, uh, which in turn triggers reporting requirements. Then you have additional uh, PFAS restrictions that go under the POPs regulation, and then you have other restrictions that go under the plastic food contact materials regulation, and there could be other restrictions too uh, for cosmetics or for other types of food contact materials that I'm not including in this video, because my intention is not to cover every single regulation in this video. This is essentially based on research that we did in 2023, and that's what we could find at the time, but there could definitely be other uh, restrictions out there. But let me put it this way. The first thing you need to do is to look under reach and also the POPS regulation to essentially get up to date on the different types of PFAS that are now subject to restrictions, because this is a, an area that um, is, is evolving in the sense that they are adding more types of PFAS to these, these um, to basically subjecting them to different restrictions under the regulations. And REACH and the POPS regulation can basically be applied to all consumer products. That's where I would begin. And then you simply have to look at additional restrictions that may apply to, say, different types of food contact materials or to, say, cosmetics or something like that. Something that can be even more challenging is understanding which specific PFAS to test for. My recommendation is that you bring this question to a testing company. You ask a qualified testing company like Intertech, like SGS or Kima, Eurofins, based on the product type, based on the material, they can usually provide an assessment and say that we believe that this and this and that PFAS should be tested when it comes to this specific product type. So that's the approach that I would uh, recommend, which is also the approach that we take when it comes to, um, let's say, substance testing that are not unique to PFAS, but to other substances like phthalates or heavy metals and so on. So I would definitely rely on a qualified testing company to decide which PFAS that you should test for. And this in turn requires that you can give them uh, product information and material information. Okay, hope you learned a thing or two from this video. If you want to access more information about product compliance in the EU, the US, the UK, and other countries, then you can go to compliancegate.com.